Everybody seeing it okay? Yep. Okay. So yeah, what I was going to talk about today is is the Strabo Strabo spot effort uh, that we have going on, and I'll explain some of the background, some of the technology, some of how we do things, and what the community is like. Um, and hopefully, this will resonate with with you all to some extent. Um, and I believe, uh, Yolanda, you're now part of the Strabo effort on microstructures. So um, yes. anyway, yes, this is, um, uh, we started out mostly what I'm going to talk about today is for structural geology and tectonics. Uh, there's a lot of people involved. Um, and if I put everybody involved today on the screen, they're be much smaller type and many, many more people. Um, just a second. There we go. Um, so where did this get started? Uh, you know, there has been a bunch of us interested in uh, data systems for structural geology for a long time. And there's some mapping data systems that are out there, but really focusing in on structural geology um, didn't didn't really get off the ground um, in the late 2000s, mid to late 2000s. But in 2012, we had a domain end user workshop for structure and tectonics. Um, and basically, Basil uh, Tickoff and I organized this. It was the first EarthCube domain end user workshop. There was one EarthCube young scientist workshop before this, but was this was actually the very first one. and. Um, at the end of a couple days, uh, we came out with the conclusion that there is currently no digital data base for structural geology data. And that really made it very hard to share the data um, to understand uh, what other people were doing. It was just, just very difficult. Um, and there are no standard, no nothing. So that's that's where we started out. And Jim Bowering was there, Maddie Bukerji was there, who uh, did a, a RCN project, kind of moving forward with this, um, and at the end of the of the kind of time with this, um, we started. We had some leftover workshop money, so we just ran some more workshops. And it's kind of what you would think. You know, you get together with a whiteboard and you uh, bounce ideas off each other about what the data are, how they're put together. But I, I think the real strength at the start of this effort and continuing with this effort is that we are really trying to engage the communities. So we ran a series of workshops. Uh, we continue to run workshops where we bring in various people. Uh, some people are field people, uh, some people are lab people, uh, etc. And we talk about how the data should be structured. I mean, that's always, you know, you could talk about that forever. But the big thing that we have tried to do, or I think the important thing for us that we've tried to do, is look at how people do field work, look at how people collect data. So um, that, I think, has been uh, our starting point in everything we do. And um, I think because of that, uh, we've had some good buy-in for this. Um, so. What came out of this early on was this idea of spots. And uh, don't read anything more into spot than it's a spot on the earth or a spot on a thin section. But this just shows an example where you have, um, is my cursor showing up? Yes. OK, this is a field area in the Klamath Mountains of California. This is a geologic map from that field area. And um, on that geologic map, there's a lot of different measurements. And there's a lot of structure. There are dikes. There are folds. You can see these green things wiggling around here. And the idea was that when we're out making observations, just like somebody putting a laser spot on a thin section or a mineral grain or you know, doing some kind of analysis like that, you, you have a spot that you're interested in, it has some important information with it, and that important information has an area to which it applies. So for example, uh, this green fold, this green fold, 
you know, we can collect some information around that that gives us some idea about how much the rock has been squished, the finite strain. But then once we have the different rock types in here, you can see the different lists down here. Um, it gives us something about the rheology, about how the rocks behave at different uh, temperatures, pressures, etc. So we gather information from all of these locations and then we make an interpretation over a larger area or over a larger spot, if you will, of the rheology and finite strain. So then this keeps going. So that outcrop right there is this one. You can see the fold that comes around. Structural geology, we measure orientations of layering thicknesses and things like that. So um, we collect that information, then we grab a rock sample and make a thin section out of it and look at individual grains here. So the, the idea here is that um, structural geology data and, and most data uh, near science is pretty um, independent of scale in a lot of ways, or it has, it crosses necessarily huge amounts of different scale parameters. Um, you know, it's, it's the classic sort of GIS uh, approach where GIS doesn't actually have a scale, it's just your intended scale of use. So in this case, the map is the scale of use, in this case, the outcrop, and in this case, the thin section. So it all follows the, the hierarchy. And when we got to thinking about this and we, we put that together, um, we realized, okay, how do we want to relate things? How do different things relate? And for example, in this case, this is a, a folded rock. The red um, symbols here are the orientation of layering. So that's important for a structural geologist. And that's one type of data. Then this red arrow is another type of data. And so if you start thinking about this in kind of a typical data base approach, all of a sudden you have to have all these data that they should be related. So, um, you know, you have these strikes and dips, the red symbols here that are in the same fold, they have some information behind them. But then you want to make sure that you have a relationship between those, that they can be the same layer, that we're following this, this white band around. And then that gave us this idea, well, a spot's just an observation, but it can also be a relationship with an area of importance. So that's sort of the philosophy we um, adopted early on, the approach we adopted early on. And so we started thinking, okay, how are we gonna build this into an easy to use data structure? And so if you look at it, you have the strikes and dips, which are layers, you have this axis, different data type, it's sitting here. It's all part of the same structure here, but then again, you also want to keep the fact that this has the same layer. So in thinking about this, um, we came up with the idea that basically this is much more of a graph uh, than it is a relational database. So this is should be familiar to everybody. This is basically where we, we come in. We have all the nodes in here and the edges. The edges are often relationships. Um, they can be anything they want to be. The nodes can have attributes, data associated with them, and obviously the edges can as well. So the idea is that we took this approach as a graph system as probably being the easiest way to, to build up the structure. The other thing um, that came with, did I go, I go backwards, sorry. The other thing that came up with this is that um, most of us had a relational database background, and we just realized that if we start to try to preserve these relationships as joins, it's probably going to be impossible to do anything really pretty cool. Whereas uh, Neo4j is a graph database, you know, doing the transversals here uh, turns out to be pretty fast, and we can collect the information together a lot, a lot more easily. Hey, if anybody has any questions, just ask. Um, but anyway, so we, we took a graph approach and of course um, schemas relaxed. We, we basically work with these community groups to build a lexicon of words. What do they mean? How are they related? Um, so for example here, if you look at the fold geometry, you can have these many, but the fold can also have shapes. So that, that curved 
layer that I was showing you in the previous slide, um, you know, you can have different aspects to it. So we keep that together, but then we spatially keep everything together and logically keep everything together as well. Uh, spatial, um, we call nesting. Basically, that's the way you um, put things together and, and then logically you uh, add labels or tags or relationships to aspects of the geology. So start out with this uh, Strabo data system uh, for the field. There's also an, uh, an office version. The office version is basically um, you know, a web page where you can do query, you can import, export your data. It's, it's all very flexible. Um, so you, you get an account and it's a mobile app. So this is actually a picture of my phone. Um, we're starting to work with sedimentary geology and petrology too, um, different aspects of geology. And I should put under here microstructures uh, as well. So we're, we're starting to expand out the system. Uh, in these areas. So this is just, you know, kind of keeping track of the Strabo Spot website, um, as this is strabospot.org. Um, so when we got into this, we, we were looking at everybody's workflow. And so um, the idea is we wanted a mobile system, but we also wanted a system that was really flexible uh, for people who didn't want to use mobile devices. So field geologists use mobile devices. They also use field computers. They also just use maps and pens and paper. So that's really why we had to build everything up the way we did. We have to have a mobile system, but we um, also allow all that functionality of the mobile system to collect data, plus a lot of other stuff on the online system that I just showed you. So the mobile system, um, we knew a lot of people were into iOS, iPads, and iPhones. I've mapped only on my iPhone for the last three years. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, you have another base with Android. So the question was, um, can we develop two code bases or, you know, we don't have that much money, what are we gonna do? So we, we ended up going to this sort of hybrid application development where we use Ionic and Angular, Angular for the JavaScript, Ionic for the uh, environment, and then working with Apache Cordova to basically farm uh, the code out to both systems. And in fact, we use the same code base for the online system as well. So it's, it's basically recycled into everything that we're doing. Um, this is just an image and to show you a few things about what goes on uh, when you're in the field. Um, so basically a field geologist likes to work on maps. This is a satellite image. This is a GPS locator. So we take advantage of all the GPS uh, facilities uh, within uh, mobile devices. Um, the map here, we can add points, lines, polygons. We can edit anything we want. And we can have very rich map layers that go behind it. So there are a lot of tile services out there, um, a couple of which, one called Mapbox and one called Map Warper that we use quite a bit. Mapbox is a big organization, uh, hundreds of employees now, and, and we have a deal with them that they'll serve our tiles to us uh, at least for the next year for free. Um, Map Warper is run by a guy at the, uh, a GIS specialist at the uh, New York City library system, but it allows you to import any image and warp it so it's in real world coordinates. And he also runs uh, a tile service. So it's very nice. It's all free at this point. So anyway, this is starting interface. So everything is a spot. That's what you got to remember is everything's a spot. So this line, this point is a spot. This line actually is a spot. It is has a certain width to it in the field and uh, a location. So spots don't have to be round. So anyway, then you put in a strike and dip. Uh, you have some lexicon words that come in in an orientation um, and the type of observation you're making. Um, this is the dialogue page for adding that. You can add any information that you want. Um, you, by using this thing that says, 
associated linear feature. Uh, this is actually the way you build relationships. So we have just keeping track of relationships in the background. Um, again, this is all standard uh, definition, standard uh, vocabulary that the community has put together. We actually uh, are working and have implemented a compass so that you can, for orientations, which is what a lot of structural geologists do in the field, you can just generate it um, on the fly on the mobile device, and then the mobile device will read that in, and that becomes the data fields. There's some hardware issues with the compass I'm not going to go into, but we're trying to work with some people to understand um, those sorts of, of accuracies. And, um, uh, variabilities as well. So that's just one example of taking a measurement. Um, there are a lot of these dialogues that get put together, but again, they're all, uh, they were all done so that they fit into people's workflow and that the vocabulary is vetted by the community. And there's a whole lot of interoperability that we're building in, and I won't go into that in too much other than um, a couple examples here. The first the spots can come out as KML and Google Earth. We actually have other formats that they come out in. Um, one for uh, a couple other programs that structural geologists use. And we're just, uh, we implemented and we're, we're tuning up something we call the field book view. And uh, that was suggested to us a year ago that, um, you know, geologists go around with their field book in their hand and make observations and measurements. Well, we actually have a way to just print out all those observations, measurements, pictures, because the pictures are all, images are all integrated into it as well that you take, so that you can actually get a, a PDF or print a file that shows your entire field history that you went through. Um, so there's a lot of in interacting with GIS, of course, is another really important um, thing to do. So um, in the, the map and geology world, uh, ArcMap ESRI products are, are very, very common. Uh, I worked for um, 20 years developing uh, these sorts of ESRI Arc Info, Arc GIS, Arc View uh, plugins and, and capabilities. Um, you know, again, establishing, you can see here in this dialog box at the bottom, uh, vocabulary that comes through. Um, so in the geological sciences and in geological surveys um, and industry, GIS is, is really very important. So what we're working on as well is to uh, allow Strabo to interact pretty seamlessly with GIS. So. Uh, we have capability at the website to simply load in shapefiles. Um, and I don't have an example of it here yet, and I probably don't have time to do it anyway, where uh, we have a student working on ARC and QGIS plugins so that essentially uh, you can edit the database live from your GIS application. And I think that's going to be something important for a lot of people. Um, the GIS applications are, you know, <laughs> they have a lot of horsepower behind them, uh, and if we can make expose and allow people to work easily with our data in there, that would be great. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on, on development. Just real quick, why is it called Strabo? Uh, Strabo was a Greek geographer, and he was probably the first structural geologist, tectonicist, and if you just read this quote, basically he figured out that uh, for some reason earthquakes uh, could raise and lower the ground surface and that changes in um, uh, where the sea was and continents were somehow related to structure. So anyway, that was hopefully informative and I'll take any questions. That's Strabo at Strabo's home. So, Doug, um, how many people are using this actively as part of their science workflow? You know, we, I'll give you a different number. Uh, we did a short course at GSA, um, and at GSA, we 
So about since November 1 till last week, we had gotten about 200 new users um, and about 120 of those had actually submitted data to the system. So uh, I don't know. We don't, um, we don't keep track of that too much. Um, people can keep their data private if they want. Uh, it's not exposed. They can make it public. Um, and so um, we just, I just basically track new users and new users who have submitted data. So, so we, had a, we had a launch party and a good time at GSA with our short course. And I think, uh, <coughs> I think we've gotten, a lot of people are pretty excited to start using it. Are people able to interact with like GitHub or something to? Um... Yeah, it's Strabo, uh, Strabo Mobile uh, at GitHub. And you can go there and, and follow everything uh, there as well. And make you can make issues there. Oh yeah, yeah. And people do. And do you have uh, online help? Yeah, we've. Uh, it's actually a static help right now. We have a very extensive help document. Let me just. Um, I can just show you a couple things here. Let me start up a browser. So, um, so this is the website as it is now. Um, you can do searches, pretty elementary searches, but this is sort of the extent of public data that we have uh, in the system now. But for example, let me just go down here. I sent a student out to the field uh, who was working in Strabo. And she did a, she's doing a senior honors project. And so I said, well, I want to see what you're doing. Just make your data live when you upload it. So she, she did. And so this is a week and a half worth of mapping from a senior honors thesis. So this is the kind of data we get in. Um, as far as the help is concerned, um, I had an undergraduate working on this, and then now he's a graduate student. He really writes quite well, but he wasn't too savvy on, uh, we have a Drupal uh, instance for doing online help. So for right now, he put everything together in Word and PDF document. It's a fairly extensive help menu, help system, and, and you can link across to different aspects of it if you want uh, data entry, et cetera. Um, and uh, this will go online, but we just, you know, there's only so much time to do things. So yeah. Gonna... So speaking speaking of that, was there? Do you have a in mind a, a sustainability plan? So the sustainability plan, we we've, we've talked about that constantly, and we've explored with GSA as to whether they could host this and work development. Uh, we haven't gotten very far there, uh, but I think a society for sustainability would be quite good. We're also talking a little bit to the IRIS group um, as to whether they would want to host this as well. So the sustainability we've worried about, but we haven't, we haven't moved too far forward with it. One thing I will say is that um, this is all um, uh, based on uh, uh, web services. Uh, there's a plot, a spot here for programmers to come in to be able to develop uh, their own applications uh, to go with this as well. We want to move the help into a more uh, robust system, but um, an online system is just getting that spun up so that people maintain it is is something we have to look at. I guess the so, other thing to say is that uh, right before uh, the GSA meeting in October, uh, Strabo Spot came out and was available freely on both iTunes for the App Store and uh, Google Play. So if you want to so grab the, it, it in. Your funding is, how long is your funding going to go on? So our funding, we have two more years of, of funding on one project. 
and about three more years on another project. So we're looking at in two years from now, we need to have a, a some kind of sustainability model that, that is in better shape. Um, yeah. One, one thing that we've looked at a little bit, and I've talked to the flyover country people, is they're thinking about doing a startup. Um, and uh, they're going to start working on that to see whether that is a sustainable model uh, for them. Um, one person at KU I haven't talked to, um, McClendon, uh, let's see, Brian or Brendan McClendon, uh, who was one of the original developers of Google Earth, um, is sort of on adjunct faculty here now, and I was. I will get an appointment with him sometime soon to see what kind of availability we, ha we might have there. Um, I, you know, if you remember earlier versions of Google Earth um, uh, zoomed into uh, somewhere in Lawrence, Kansas, and it turned out that was his uh, apartment when he was an undergraduate. So um, I think he's given a couple talks here. I think he's well enough connected. He's mostly into autonomous vehicles um, and mapping now, so I bet I, I want to pick his brain on this as well. And any suggestions you guys have would be wonderful. Well, I, I'll, the one main suggestion I have is uh, just to plant the seed of somehow documenting and maybe writing a paper about whatever your sustainability solution is, because uh where there's a uh, deficit of the working sustainability models out there i believe yeah if you're I successful know that that's true so does anyone I've, anyone else have questions for doug this is yolanda i have two questions doug you yeah. talked about the terms um in your lexicon being nested so usually when you think about terms, you might do nesting because some are parts of others or because they are subclasses of others or it could be other kinds of relations. So um, are, is your nesting representing any of those or a particular it's, it's, kind it's, of those? It's almost all subclasses. So, um, and it's a classification, it's basically a tiered classification theme. So when you see a fault, the fault can be of different types. For a structural geologist, we'd say normal, reverse, or strike slip. But then each one of those can have different aspects to them. So really the lexicon is put together so that it helps guide people through making the observations that they want and so that we do not have like every single term at every level of detail replicated. So, so basically, we use a tool. Um, let's see if it comes called Kobo Forms. Are you mm -hmm. Kobo no. tool? Um, let me just pull this up. Um, What Kobo does, uh, Kobo Toolbox. It Basically, you mostly have. Go ahead. Sorry, Hello? I was just trying to feel the air while you were clicking. Oh, can you sorry. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> I, I was just trying to feel the air while you were clicking around. Uh, oh, okay. But basically, it's, it sounds like most of your nesting is a. Uh, class taxonomy uh, of classes and subclasses and then uh, you also have part of your vocabulary be those uh, properties or attributes or relations as you call them right right so the idea is that this is a this is not how it's implemented in the app but the idea is that um, this isn't a good one let me open a um, better one here to show you kind of why we use it the way we do. Um, let me find a good one here. Um, where's Migmatite? Oh, there it is, okay. So for example, um, 
you have different classes and when you click on a class there are certain things associated with this class that would be different than would be associated with other classes so a lot of this is done so that the um, theologists can move themselves through what they would normally do um, in classifying um, different aspects of, of the rock. So they're just tiered uh, this way um, into that structure. Okay, and uh, do you do you export this as an ontology uh, that someone else could use? We can export this into either um, XLS forms or XML. So um, it could be taken in, I think, as an ontology in XML. Um, I think it, I think it would need a few more things, but okay. um, it's it's something. I mean, I I'd be happy to talk to you more about this. But if someone else wanted to adopt this vocabulary and this structure in their system, if you exported it as an ontology, that would be easier for them to see okay. all these dependencies and constraints and restrictions and another question another question for me is uh, if, if someone's using this and suppose that they're you know they want to describe something about Ligma types that you don't have in the system besides adding a you know just a comment or a note to themselves uh, is there a process or a way to extend the current lexicon yeah, so we have this uh, this field or this item we call other features, and basically um, what other features allows people to do is classify it as some sort of geologic feature, and then that feature becomes part of their um, part of their instance of Strabo, part of that project. So yeah, we allow people to. That's the whole idea behind this: is that um, if we tried to make every possible thing work, we'd never get done. So we get what is most commonly used, and then people can add other information to it. We haven't gotten a lot of other information added, but the thought was that if somebody started adding a lot of some particular new feature or a new feature became common, then we could incorporate that into the, into the application and into the database easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. One, Thank you very much. Thing, yeah, one thing I will say, um, uh, you know, I, I've been doing uh, the GIS for a long time as an educational process, and we, we teach GIS and data structure, um, relational database structure as part of a couple of our courses, and I use, usually do a little bit of it in our field camp. And uh, the idea is that the data system or whatever you're using should help guide you through making observations. And the last couple of years that we've used this, the students have given us a lot of very positive feedback that yes, the application works fine and it helps us make observations. It helps us know what we should be looking for. So that's been, been actually a big bonus of this. I will say too that when we were doing just kind of strictly arc map, arc view, uh, it would take a day or two for the uh, students to get the hang of it and start adding information very effectively. Um, the developer we have, well, had developers, one developer now working on the interface, and what we found is that for some reason, students just know how to use apps. And so usually within the first couple hours of the first morning, they're more or less pretty proficient at just collecting information. That's been a very pleasing development as well. Probably not surprising at all. All right. Anyone else have questions for Doug? I just have a question about, uh, this is Bruce, about what does success look like um, in, let's say, five years if uh, this gets picked up by several thousand people and uh, um, you know, what would this do to just the science? Uh, what, do you have a, a vision of success? Yeah, that's a really good, good point. I would say that, I hate to say it, 
I don't want to sound weird, but I'd say this is already somewhat successful because this is the first place I know of that you can go to where people have contributed data that you could actually get the data, the information on what they did and, and look at it. So, um, you know, the fact that I can go here and this person has put in all this data, I can then go through, for example, and then download this uh, shapefile, KMZ, you know, in a lot of different formats. So I feel like to some extent, um, our launch party and the GSA went well because we had some people adopting it. But I think your point, five years from now, it would be that, uh, I don't, I can't put a number on it, but I would say that it was being used by a significant number of professionals. It was being used by a significant number, uh, significant percentage of field camps. Uh, field camps, there's a huge amount of interest in this for field camps. When we ran our short course, 90% uh, uh, of the participants were interested in 80% because they wanted to use the field camps. So uh, I would say that would be good. I think another measure of success would be that we do have some sustainability model that somebody's ready to take it on. Whether that is GSA, AGU, um, some NSF facility, or even kind of spinning it off now. Does that sound successful? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would think the LTERs <laughs> might pick this up too and some other groups that uh, are trying to do, in, you know, measurements that add up to something greater than the sum of their parts. Yeah, the other thing that we're, we're starting to explore right now, I, I think is going to be really big um, is the whole structure from motion community. Are you familiar with them? No. So there's all this technology now that you could go out to an outcrop with your iPhone or Android phone. You could take a thousand pictures and you can mesh those together into a 3D model. And that software, that availability is all out there. Uh, and nobody's taking advantage of it other than looking at images and drawing on them. And so I think one of our next things that we're gonna be doing is um, working with trying to integrate somehow those structure from motion images into the Strabo data system so that not only do you get the image, which is incredibly valuable, but then you have actual information that is explorable and searchable behind it. So I think that's, a, that's something I'm, We've got somebody um, on board now who does a lot of structure from motion. Um, there are several programs out there, but I kind of the general term I've always heard is structure from motion. It's basically, it would be akin to basically do, taking LIDAR images. I mean, it's, it's right. essentially a different technique for LIDAR. Cool. Yeah, I would love to have LIDAR information come in and have this be truly 3D. So, okay, great. Um, anyone else? Questions? Well, uh, Doug, thank you for presenting. Um, no, that was great. Thank you for the comments. Yeah. And uh, hopefully you'll get, we'll get some good traffic on the uh, YouTube channel for this talk and uh, ESIP will promote it a little, a little, I'm sure. And, um, Again, thanks, and thank everyone else. I think that uh, we pretty much covered our bases here. Jay sent me a text saying,